Cameron, is it cooled off down there or up there, over there, wherever? Actually, it went the opposite way, Annie. Sorry. Logged into Zoom. Today. I need to use the AC. <laughs> nice. It might cover that. I don't know. We don't have AC out here in Seattle. Most yeah. of us. So I, I have this portable one that actually I have a fan blowing on right now. That's my first line of defense. And then uh, after that, fan runs out probably around five o'clock. We're a little earlier here, right? It's uh, almost two o'clock Pacific time. Yeah. But around five o'clock, six o'clock, you got to have the AC just to help out. Otherwise, it just goes really hot. Yeah. I went home the other day and my heat, my air conditioner was not on. Like, oh, ah, that's not good. <laughs> Luckily, my yeah, it's hard for Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, and then it takes a while to catch up. That's the hard part. Is, yeah. Uh, it's it's behind, so it's like oh. Yeah, it was eighty yeah. in the house, and the the thermostat was <clears throat> just needed batteries. Thank goodness. Cool. What? Indeed, it's so hot in our house. Why? Are you all the AC out? No, it's just we've got a lot of south facing windows, mm -hmm. and it just gets sun, and the upstairs just is an oven. No. Wow, you guys just keep moving. We don't. We don't move. I have get a, get a wider lens. <laughs> you're, hey, yeah, you're on us. <laughs> hey, <laughs> y'all chill out in there. Who do we got on right now? We got Richard Grace, <laughs> Eduardo Simone, Martin Eastburn, Andrew Corkill, and Cameron Gillis, who's actually on with us right now. Is that allowed, Cameron? Where you're actually in chat and on the program at the same time. <laughs> You're the boss. You, t you tell me, Scott. <laughs> I think it's Martin says I had to spray yeah, water I, on our fins outside as they were delivering hot gas, not liquid, inside the house. A little water fixed that. That's cool. Little little uh, air conditioning hack right there. Mike Wiesner's on. Says hello and Book Davies need a more bigger scope. Beatrice Hines says hello. Photon chasers. Happy Friday. Yes, it is. It's Happy Friday. So for all of you at home that, uh, you know, if you want to have your adult beverage, you can. We have to wait until after work is done. So that's how that goes here. But now your adult beverage could just be coffee, you know, could be. It doesn't have to be. But. I'm going to grab my tea. Be right back. Okay. <laughs> I always agree to coffee. Always. Anytime? Anytime. Really? Midnight? Anytime. Yeah, I, don't, right? I don't care. I better be in bed sleeping at midnight. I mean, just saying. Well, well now that you're learning how to use uh, equatorial mount, I mean, then you won't have to sleep anymore. You won't be faced with that burden of sleeping. Sleeping. You still a have burden. something to do. I didn't know sleeping was a burden. <laughs> I hardly, I hardly get it. Woke and when you wake up in the morning, you're all groggy and you got to get yourself going and stuff, and you have to have coffee. No, that's, no, sir. That's, you know, think of it like as a sickness, you know, that you, no, 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 you, know, no, you no. find into a near coma state. Okay. No. Hey, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I actually jump out of bed, but I just jump out of bed, Scott, and then I'm ready to go. Like, it oh, really? just happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how I do it. Too. <laughs> uh -huh. Scott, can you hear me? I hear you. We might need you to pin some images because we're going to be showing them from my laptop, but using the microphones uh, that Paul has. So to keep it from switching the screens, I'm not, Paul was so... saying we need to ask you about pinning. We'll try that. Okay. Yeah, we'll try. <laughs> we'll try that. Okay. You guys ready to get going here? Yes, sir. We're going on with Annie first, because it's Arc Minutes with Annie. Here we go. <laughs>
Annie, do you know that guy that's turning that hologram around? Uh, that actually is me in real <laughs> life. I'm just saying. <laughs> It's, it's identical, the right? And the beard and identical. Stuff. It looks wow. identical to me. Identical. Wow. What do you do? You stuff all your hair underneath like a plastic thing? I, well, I, well, this actually comes off at night. I mean, because oh, I think I he's see. bald. Yeah, he's mine bald. does too. I, I, <laughs> you know, I always try to make sure it's adjusted on right before oh, I go yeah. on for these programs. You me know, too. Make sure the staple me too. I try to, I try to, you know, the you know and fluff it and holding yeah. it on mm -hmm. correctly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't have it on backwards. No. <laughs> Hate that. Oh, I do. See, see, but then, but see, in reality, I could just take my hair and have the mustache, and then it would be all good. Oh, that's just cool. move it from my head to my lip wow. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. Speaking of Chuck and I, we both uh, forgot to shave for the show, so we do apologize to the audience. Oh, really? That's like a five o'clock yeah. shadow you guys have going on. <laughs> well, right? the, this is the week o'clock shadow, but the week uh, o'clock. I don't grow much, but it, it probably was time yeah. to shave. Yeah, to get a beard like yours, I'd have to grow up for about like I don't know a lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> You know. Just shave this morning. Just want to let everybody know, yeah. right? <laughs> Thanks for doing that. The way I used to shave, I would put cream on my face and then I'd let the cat lick it off. You know, so yeah. and so that that worked. That worked pretty good. Oh my gosh! <laughs> too much information. Too much. Too much information. Well, it does sound yeah, like we're already aboard the mothership. <laughs> that's right so, so wait it makes it easier it does wait Mar martin eastburn says a staple gun helps with that helps with what i want to know what it helps with holding your hair on the swing line on there and pop in a few duct tape in arkansas is the best thing ever i'm just saying that's what rednecks around here use it's probably not a technical term i probably duct should tape? use that yeah, what is duct it tape. everybody oh. fixes everything with duct tape around duct tape. here it works. That's right. It works really good. Works Do you know really that from good. experience? Well, they, they even say for backpackers, for explorers, that the number Everything. one thing to bring with you is not a knife, is a roll of duct tape. Um, if you get hurt, know. actually duct tape can really hurt, help you, not hurt you, yeah, help can, you. Yeah, you could, can you can set a bone, bone you could, thing. you know, you could close a wound. Well, we do have an awesome guest here today. Um, and, you know, when we get a guest this awesome, we normally just turn the ships, uh, turn the keys to the mothership over. And we're about to do that. But we're about to do that. First, but we're going to let we're going to let Annie uh, tell us what's going on in the yeah. Alliance. Arc minutes with Annie. Here we go. <laughs> right. The bearded lady. The bearded. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. Hey, I would fit around fit in around here. For, with some of, some of the CSRs. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So we still have that astrophotography contest going on. Um, Tyler's about to tell me how many people we have um, that have signed up for that. I, you know, last time it was, we only had nine people. Um, and so we're going to get an email out. I just talked to our, our email lady. We're going to, our email lady. We have 10 now. We email have 10. lady. Email lady. <laughs> I, See, it's because I don't have coffee right now, Scott. Oh, that's, that's why. What it is. That's I why I can't speak correctly. Anyways, um, so our person, our email, email person, person. Um, our, our uh, Trisha, Trisha is going to send out an email to everybody about uh, just kind of letting everybody know about um, astrophotography contest and that we have that go until August fifteenth. Um, yep. We also have that PMC eight um, survey that's going through August 1st that we need everybody that has a PMCA to please, 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 please fill out. Um, I looked at it today and I think we had uh, 55 people. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. We had 55 people pretty that have good. filled it out. Um, there are prize, there are prizes. If you fill it out and fill every, you have to fill everything out to be eligible um, to win some things. Um, and then uh uh still you know our our membership is growing still um we i think we're up to i think we're up to like a little over 50 or a little over 40 people that have joined on a, on our new system um and our new um our new way of signing up and so um, i'm not going to transpose our older members over to that just because <clears throat> we have like 1200 of them and mm -hmm. so um that would take me a really 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 long time 
to do that. So, um, but I can always look up a membership if somebody's questioning whether or not they they are an Explore Explore Alliance member. Just please just <clears throat> reach out to me, um, email Explore Explore Alliance at Explore Scientific, and I can always check and verify and confirm that uh, for you. So um, <clears throat> we have a couple of new ambassadors I'm about to add. So we have we have some people there that, that are onboarding with us. Who's our, who's our new ambassadors that are coming? Um, you had to ask me that. One of them just had yeah. a little tiny baby. Oh, yeah. yeah, he just had a little tiny baby. I think and one he, of them's Egon Reich, right? Yes, e, yes, yes. Egon, Egon, Egon yeah. is, and then um, the other gentleman just had a baby. So we're still working working that out because you know adjusting to a new little one is a little. Um, it's just different you know, so, but your life changes. Um, and then um, we have all the new, uh, you know, the calendar is going to be changing soon. I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't been able to update it yet. Um, Tyler keeps putting me behind the PMC, the Exos 100 PMC 8. He keeps, keeps testing. We're getting me. ready. We're getting ready for when yeah. they all get here. So yeah. we're going to yeah. handle yeah. any problem that might come up. Yeah. So, um, or you could just call us and tell us how much you love it, how much you love the P the Exos 100 or Exos 2. <laughs> yeah, you can always do PMCA. that. You can always call us and tell us, I, we love it. This is the most amazing thing ever. It actually is an amazing system. Um, it was kind of funny the other day I was playing with one and I was on a meeting, had to stop and I was on a meeting. All of a sudden it started moving. And one of our, one of our engineers comes over and was like, oh, that's where that mount is. And it, I'm like, oh, you're messing with it. Great. <laughs> Like I'm trying to train on Another it. Another so, big question. I, I I hate to put you on the spot, but uh, how is it looking for the next shipment? Yeah. <laughs> um. I yeah. I can't answer that question. I wish I could. I know. We, I know. You know, we yeah. potentially late. You know, late summer, early fall. You know, we can't. It, it just almost uh, late summer now. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's we, getting there. We um. You know, our stuff goes to the dock and it sits forever and a day. And we just, I mean, we just don't. Yeah, the, the just whole, know. you know, logistics thing is really messed up. Yeah, it so is really bad. Really right need now. to go no further than looking at Google News and type in logistics woes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's it affecting all industries. Right it's true. Yeah. yeah. No, I just have to ask. Seattle, which is a major port. You, oh, you yeah. I feel it. Time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's true. I mean, it's affecting, uh, but, but, but on the, Positive side, like I say, I, I am looking forward to reviewing the uh, Exos 2 as soon as I have one in my hand. So, that, you know, hopefully later yeah. this year, uh, I can't wait. I'm very excited. So, yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it, 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 it is fun to play with and fun to learn. And so um, that and is really, it's really deep. Get, yeah. We can't wait to get one in your hands, Cameron. Yeah. You bet. There's there, going to be some fun, some fun times ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're patient. You, we're patient Annie. here. Have we, have we traversed the uh, the full arc minute? So yeah, um, we just uh, <laughs> arc minutes. Gonna... Arc, arc minutes. Not arc minutes. minutes. I like to talk a lot. Okay, I'm just say it. No, I'm just, no, I don't actually. Yeah. Um, so I'm um, trying to think of anything else. We just have uh, stars and sauces coming up. Um, Are you going to stars and sauce? I Is would like. Going? Yes, I, I want to. I'll probably take my son there and go. But yeah. Okay, so if you don't know what Stars and Sauce is, and we've talked about it before several days now, but it is a music festival with telescopes and astronomy. And so Explore Scientific was invited last year. We went, uh, carefully went, um, and they did uh, appropriate um, social distancing. And uh, I assume they're going to do the same this year as well. Yeah. It's up in Eureka Springs. If you don't know about Eureka Springs, it is an artist colony. Uh, it's very cool. Uh, you know, I'm from California and spend some time hanging out in places like Berkeley and stuff. And I, if if Arkansas has a Berkeley, it's Eureka, Eureka. Springs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is it You're is right. really that cool. And uh, uh, so there is a uh, there is a place called the farm okay which makes me think of what woodstock or something all right and um uh it is a concert venue and an outdoor concert venue and this is two days of music uh i think it's two solid days i don't think they stop performing until oh, wow. the final day's over okay so um but uh you know you have the telescopes out there you have the social distancing you've got music um, so it should be a lot of fun. 
And uh, we are not selling the tickets for it. So you do have to go on to the best place to go is on Facebook uh, mm -hmm. to the uh, star, uh, uh, Stars and Sauce Facebook page, I think is what it's called. Let me find it for you. And while you're finding that, Scott, I just want to remind everybody that we still have those etched, um, those etched, laser those etched, yeah, laser etched uh, ED 152s, and we, um, and then we also have the buy no viewers for uh, pre-ordered, so that you can pre-order. So those are our two things. Hope uh, we're uh, looking at some other things that we're gonna, that we're prob probably gonna throw out there for um, some EA members, but um, <clears throat> I think we've talked. I know. I, a month or so ago, you and I, Scott, talked about something. But uh, anyway, so we, you know, there's a lot of changes coming. Um, I I am a one-man show, and I still do customer one service. One-woman show. <laughs> yes. So so be patient. Be patient. Be patient with me is all I ask. Please, please, It's please. a supporting cast here. So. <laughs> it's a supporting Thank you, cast. Amy. Right. Yeah, we so, love it. So, but that's, that, that's about it. I mean, we, uh, you know. If you need me to update your membership, let me know and we'll take care of it. If you have an issue, please call me, please email me and we can, and I can get it resolved for you. So cool. Yep. Thank you, Annie. So, yep. Thank you. All right. So we're, we're going to, we're going to transition right now. So here we go. Well, yeah, let's go to our, our guest of the day, the man of man's. Are we doing not, the video? Not quite. Not quite. Oh, you still have some okay. more. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Still have some more. Before the International Space Station, before the Hubble Space Telescope, before the shuttle, before Skylab, before Apollo, before NASA even, there was Lyman Spitzer. This has been an Aeronautics and Space Report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. 75 years ago, astronomer Lyman Spitzer envisioned a future for space exploration that changed our understanding of the cosmos and our place in it. A visionary behind the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer was among the earliest astronomers pioneering a revolutionary way to explore the universe through astronomical satellites. With the publication of his famed paper in 1946, Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory, Spitzer explored the benefits of launching a large reflecting telescope into orbit around our planet. His proposal placed these telescopes outside of the constraints of Earth's atmosphere, enabling both greater access to wavelengths of light not visible from the ground and higher quality images free of atmospheric effects. Spitzer made a strong case for large space telescopes that would allow humanity to access unseen parts of the universe. Understanding the magnitude of the universe and exploring the structures of galaxies, globular star clusters, and other planets were the ultimate goals of orbiting observatories. Spitzer's vision in 1946 marked a new era for the field of astronomy, and 75 years later, space-based telescopes, like Hubble, are our best lens into the cosmos. Above Earth's atmosphere, our unimpeded view allows us to see billions of light years back in time, helping us understand the evolution of galaxies and the universe itself. We've seen celestial objects and phenomena through light not visible by the human eye, offering us a new perspective of our place in the universe. Spitzer recognized that space telescopes would enable humanity to explore beyond our frontier of knowledge to uncover new phenomena not yet imagined, and perhaps to modify profoundly our basic concepts of space and time. To this day, the Hubble Space Telescope remains a testament to Spitzer's vision and a reminder of what we may yet discover. All right, well, I am absolutely in love with all those videos. Yeah, those, those videos are the best. They, they really make the show special. Um, so, okay, Rick Marshall, finally, my man, uh, the man of mans. Surprisingly, uh, you probably wouldn't expect this guy to be an astronomer if you, you know, saw him 
you know, saw him out. You probably would see him out in the woods on a four wheeler, moving earth, uh, you know, grilling steaks. So a real cool guy, and we're we're really lucky to have him here. So, Rick, welcome aboard the mothership. I'm gonna give you the keys, and you take us somewhere. All right, all right. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm always excited to share anything in astronomy, and especially kind of my pet thing, um, which is video astronomy. So we're going to talk about that today here, and I'm going to start off with a presentation, and then uh, hopefully if I can get the sun back into the view, we can look at a live view of um, the, uh, the, the sun. Although it's not, I'll have to admit, it's not very exciting right now, and I don't have my, I've actually lent out my hydrogen alpha uh, capability. So uh, it is what it is, but uh, all right. So um, so we're gonna do a quick, fairly quick overview today. Um, so let's start off with, uh, my name is Rick Marshall. I am, I live here in Springdale, Arkansas, which is the headquarters of Explore Scientific. I head over there and bug them every so often. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's great to be, uh, uh, to, to know this group of, of folks and, and a great company. So um, let's get started. And um, so what is video astronomy? Um, so for, it's, it's really also called live imaging and it's an astronomical in, imaging technique that's similar to astrophotography, but definitely different from it. Um, they share a lot of the same aspects. So everything from, you know, how do you make sure you're in focus to, you know, worrying about exposure times to tracking, you know, um, although in video astronomy, it's not quite as important as it is in astrophotography. Um, so all of those kinds of aspects, field of view of your telescope, making sure that the object that you want to uh, image is actually can fit. Uh, you know, on the chip that, that, that you're doing. So there's, there's a lot of different aspects that both of them share, but there's a lot of differences too. And one of the main important differences between them is that video astronomy has a little bit of a different purpose. It's really focused on in the moment observing. And it's really about as if you were at the eyepiece, but you get some of the advantages of having, you know, using electronically assisted astronomy. And so in general, um, you have short, very short exposures, you have limited to no stacking and, and really no image processing at all. And over here on the right, you might see a, uh, you should be able to see a snapshot of a live video astronomy image of Jupiter here. And then below that, you can see an actual stack. Now, both of these are, are, are Im, you know, images that I've taken. And uh, here's my stacked Jupiter. So you can see a whole lot of details in the cloud. You can see a very prominent great red spot, a lot of subtle bands that you can't really see in this one. You can see a little bit of a hint of a red spot here and you can see some banding, but it's not different. And you know, it's not, it's, it's not uh, the same thing as stacking hundreds or thousands of images together and all of the kinds of processing that happens when you do stacking. And so that's, a, there, you know, there's, there's trade-offs, but instead what happens is you, you, you're really looking at it live. Uh, you, you, you're working through short exposures and you're, you, there's a lot of different advantages. So now video astronomy has been around for a long time and it's gone through an, uh, an evolution like so many things in astronomy has. So first off, let's just talk about cameras. So believe it or not, way, 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 way back, uh, when those of us that were doing video astronomy a long time ago, and I'm talking more than 10 years, even 15 years ago, we would use those old egg webcams and set them up and use them, uh, you know, and, and, and figure out how to connect them in to where the eyepiece would go. There's all kinds of DIY uh, methods that would have to be figured out to get it mounted in there. And, uh, you know, the advantage was, you know, you had very small pixels on these little cameras. Uh, they were very small chips, though, so sometimes hard to get bigger images on them. Uh, and you really couldn't control that much about the camera. So it had limited exposures. Uh, you need to have a computer connected. Uh, and there was an IR filter. So, you know, if you really wanted to get, you know, and take some pictures of more deep sky things, you need to remove that IR filter. Um, but in general, these were very bad for DSOs, but they were awfully good for planets. And that's what they were mostly used for, were, were for very early on planetary viewing. And then we moved into security cameras. So these are the, you know, the IR kinds of cameras that sit around and, you know, might monitor your house or business. 
and they had larger pixels. They were they were kind of a medium sized pixel pixels. Still had small chips. And you could control them a little bit more with a little bit of exposure. Um, but what was really interesting about these were they had analog video output. So you can you could connect a, like a BNC cable to the end of the camera, and you had to have a connector to get it into your computer. But you if you're you know if you had the right connector, you could connect that right into um, you know a monitor and have no computer at all and just watch what the camera was seeing. And so these were, you know, the standard for, for, for quite a few years, especially in the early 2000s to, to, to you know, early 210s. Um, and during that time, you started seeing some companies then take and modify these cameras and start to create the first uh, video astronomy focused cameras. Now, during this time on the astrophotography side, of course, there were imaging cameras. So don't get me wrong. I'm just speaking specifically for video astronomy. Uh, and, and, you know, some of those imaging cameras were super expensive, right? And, and some of them still are today. <laughs> But from a video perspective, now we've got the larger pictures, we've got medium exposures, you've got a little bit more gain. You even have some S video output that brings it right into a monitor. And uh, they were really good for, for DSOs. And they were mediocre for planets, but you can still get some stuff done um, there. And, uh, and, and so uh, uh, Malincam, a, a Canadian company was doing them um, uh, very early on, a couple of other companies that got started with it. And really, this is about the period of time where things started, you know, really taking off. Um, and that's when we started getting into uh, the, the more inexpensive USB connected CCDs. And we started getting better software at the same time. And now we have a wide variety of cameras from the inexpensive USB CCDs that are that look like you know little bullet cameras we call them, um, and they can do all kinds of different levels of exposure. There's all kinds of different ways to control the camera. That's all done through the USB, and the signal comes across the USB as well. The only negative is that uh, you know you've got to have a computer. <clears throat> To, to not only control the camera, but uh, take the image and do things. And the fantastic thing about these are that they really are dual purpose. You can do astrophotography as well with them. You, you know, you can certainly grab video or, or collect, um, you know, series of frames and save it to your hard drive for, for processing later. What um, camera so do you use, great. Rick? Hey, Rick, so what I have, camera do you have? Yeah, I have several cameras and I even have kept some of my older cameras. So, you know, my oldest camera is uh, Malin Cam Jr. It's called and it's one of these that has large pixels and, and a little, little bit of control and uh, um, it has an IR filter taken off of it and I can connect it straight up to a monitor and I hardly ever use it anymore. So it's kind of one of those uh, 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 kind of a relic. Um, the, um, I have several um, USB CCD cameras uh, from uh, Malincam and from a ch basically the Chinese uh, company called TubeTech that makes a lot of the cameras that can get rebranded by ZWO and, and, and Altair and, and others like that. Um, and uh, uh, the, really the important thing is from a camera perspective is what sensor are you using? And I'll show you a couple of different sensors in some of my pictures that I have. But uh, I haven't quite stepped up to the, you know, like the, the ZWO 1600s yet with, uh, with, 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 you know, cooling and and things like that. And I, I really see a lot of those as much more um, astrophotography. And I don't do a ton of astrophotography. I, I just don't have the time, unfortunately. And um, and and I, you know, I just love video astronomy, and I'll I'll, sh I'll show you some reasons why. Yeah, is there any advantage? Is there any advantages even to go into one of those higher end cameras for EA? Is is there what that goes into? Yeah, we're not we're not hearing you very well, Chuck. One second. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah, saying, it's sounding any... muffled. Yeah. Is there any advantages going to a higher end camera for EAA? Like yeah. I know with my ZWOs, Ross and I both do astrophotography. So I know with like the 533, there's high dynamic range mm -hmm. mode. And I didn't know if there's any advantage to using one of those cameras for EA versus, you know, something 
you know, another type of camera, basically. The only advantage for those is getting a larger pix getting a larger sensor array, right? A larger chip. And then, you know, uh, getting, you know, if, if you want to have more detail um, where you have more megapixels on, on that chip. So, so in general, what the trade-off is, is um, if you're going after DSOs, for example, you want to, you, 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 there's a trade-off. If you have, if your pixels are too small, they can't uh, capture enough light, right? Um, and if they're, um, but but the trade-off is if they're bigger, you can only fit so many of them. So there's a tr resolution and sensitivity, right. if you will, trade-off. Well, yeah. the, the well depth has been has been increasing quite a bit. Like it that. has been, yeah. and and one of the things part of that now, as you see here over at the end, is it used to be. It used to be CCD or, or nothing, right? It used mm -hmm. to be CCDs. That was the only thing. If you can get a class zero CCD, and that sorry for anyone, that's that means it's a very high quality CCD where you know there's very few potential hot pixels or bad pixels and things like that. Uh, but now everything's moving to CMOS chips, and the technology behind the CMOS chips um, has improved and improved and handling the electronics around it because, uh, uh, you know, not to get too technical, but some of the things you have to worry about are, uh, what's called dark current where the actual electricity of the electronics can bleed into your image and cause noise and challenges like that. And so there's been a lot of improvements in that as well. Good deal. And then the software, I mean, gosh, the software, I mean, it, you know, we used to not even really be able to control the cameras. Now we can control all kinds of aspects. We can do darks and hot pixel subtraction on the fly. There's, you know, now you can do star registration and align your image on the fly. This is done in memory and you can do in memory stacking to a certain extent with for a lot of these cameras with their software. What software are you yeah. using? So I use, so it depends on the camera that I use. So I, um, I use like what I have plugged in there right now is a two tep, two tech. Uh, it's, it's an IMX 184 chip and there's a specific software that runs it. And I'll show you that here shortly. Um, okay. And, uh, but there are also some other, you know, um, software that's out there that is, are compatible with more than you know than with many cameras there's also you know generic standards that they can run it just not all the cameras support you know some of the camera features you really want to have their own software um, to support it um, because not all of them follow all the industry standards i guess is the best way to put it yeah. So uh, just to kind of continue on how is video astronomy different? So um, the primary uses really for video astronomy is really more about observing and outreach. Whereas astrophotography is really about beautiful pictures. Sorry about the fly that keeps bugging me here. Um, both of them can do research though, right? Um, you know, there's plenty of research that's done by using astrophotography to investigate an object and, and details of the object. Um, video astronomy, you may not get as many details because you have limited exposures and no tracking, but you can also hop around and look at a lot of different objects in, in one night. Um, your exposures that you do, you know, depending upon your stacking method, you're kind of setting one exposure for that series of stacks that you're doing for that filter, et cetera. Um, with video astronomy, it's all dynamic. Like it's a playground, basically. You can move your exposures down and up again. Um, I'll show you some examples where you can, you'll see a couple of images where you can see how you can look at different details. And because we're doing a live image um, for exposures that are, for objects that have a different dynamic range, uh, sometimes you have to sacrifice blowing out a brighter part of the image to see some of the lesser details come up or you have the lesser details go away to be able to see brighter. So it's a, it's a little bit different that, you know, we're not digitally editing anything here, nothing like that. We're just observing it and, uh, um, you know, so there, there's there's some trade-offs. Um, um, stacking, you can do a little bit of stacking with, with some of the software in memory, but in general, we're not doing any stacking. We're really just kind of looking at the live image. Um, but in general, we can use all the filters that you would use in astrophotography. Um, I've done a lot of narrowband images. I will show you that, hydrogen alpha narrowband imaging, um, but light pollution filters, 
are definitely a help. Um, there's just, there's all kinds of, you know, um, of different ways that you can, they can, you can use filters. Rick, um, there's, a, there's a question in the audience. Uh, they want to know what, what is your current setup for video astronomy? Yeah, so my current setup, um, if you don't mind me here just flipping over and showing you, is this right now. This is a live little USB camera I have. So right now, what I have is a Celestron. You're, you're still I, showing the... Oh, uh, am I not right. showing the thing? Hang on just right. a second. Let me do... Sorry. Let me stop that share and share a different... I guess I was sharing it. Let me share the screen instead of... There. Hopefully, you can see now my the image of my telescope in okay. the studio. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So this is this is my current setup. It's sitting over just about 10 feet, you know, 12 feet away from me over here out in the sun and I'm sitting in the shade of my carport. Uh, <laughs> and what you see here is my Celestron nine and a quarter inch uh, Smith Cassegrain telescope on the evolution mount. Um, you know, you can see that I have a solar filter on currently, and uh, and uh, it's uh, pointed at the sun. Although I think it's tracked off of it just a tad bit. Um, I do have my Telrad on there just as a default. Mm -hmm. And the way that I have this configured right now is um, down here um, after my you know 90 degree elbow here, I have this little blue camera, and that is very similar to the camera that I showed you on this page right here. It looks just like this, this camera right here that I hope you can see. Um, and uh, that camera is got, is, has a USB, um, you know, uh, a printer type of an end that comes along here, comes over here, and it comes over to my computer. And uh, so I can pull live images and control that that camera from here. Now, what's interesting about this setup, uh, this having the Celestron, is I often off. I also have a hyperstar. So, as the, most of you know, um, I, your your you know SCT is 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 an F10 scope, um, and I do have a focal reducer in here too, just a 86% focal reducer. But one of the interesting things about um, about the Celestron. Um, you know, SETs is you can put in a hyperstar lens up here at the front and replace the secondary mirror here. Now we can't do this with solar, right? Because we can't block uh, the <laughs> the sun that way. But um, um, uh, you replace the and I've done this before. You you replace the secondary with a hyperstar. You plug your camera into the front of the scope, and now all of a sudden you're only using the primary, which on this scope turns it from an f10 scope into an f2.3 scope. So much much faster and a much wider field of view, and so that's very advantageous for uh, DSOs. So that's my current setup. Okay, um, so let's just run through just a few more things real quick. Photoshop processing, um, as I mentioned before, we don't really do that in video astronomy uh, versus astrophotography. Um, we do basic tracking in video astronomy, but we don't really have to worry about keeping the image in one place. Um, you know, some early video astronomers, even you can hook a camera up to a daub and just, you know, and manually move a daub with that doesn't have any tracking, you know, um, um, enhancements on it, and just bump it every so often, and you know, see the image in your computer. Uh, people, people do do that. Um, so uh, it's because you're kind of really just observing and you're looking at objects. You don't have to, uh, you know, be be as precise with video astronomy. And one of the biggest things for me is I can sit here in my driveway like I am to, you know, right now, and I could I could look at four, five, six, depending upon how many hours I want to sit out here, more objects in the night. Um, you know, I can, you know, switch between Jupiter, Saturn, um, you know, Mars, what, whatever happens to be up. Um, um, and switch around. And I can, if something's interesting, I might sit and watch it for a little bit, um, especially Jupiter and watching the moons come around from the back side of it or 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 go around the back side. Um, you know, that's you know, that's that's fun to watch. I might watch the moon, uh, especially on a semi-cloudy night where clouds kind of get in front of it. That's that's very cool. So um, there's a lot of different things you can do in a night versus, you know, typical astrophotography. You know, it could take you multiple, 
multiple days to, uh, you know, to get of, of imaging and, you know, weather can get in the way and all those kinds of things. So, um, and the complexity is fairly low. As you all saw, you know, I pretty much take out an eyepiece, put in my camera and go. Now, it's not quite that simple, right? Because uh, you have to worry about, well, getting your telescope in focus and, and different things like that. Um, from an, from a, a um, for here, let me jump to here. Um, let me get back to full screen mode here. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, video astronomy, another aspect of it, other than just the observing that I talked about before is really outreach. I love to do outreach. Um, I love to do things like this. Um, I have broadcast my live views on Facebook many times on some other services, Night Skies Network and SN. I even started Twitch for a little while. Sorry about my dog. Um, That's all right. We love dogs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then outreach. So this is an event from a, from Bentonville, Arkansas, for um, a local nonprofit, NWA Space, and we were doing solar astronomy, and and uh, you know people would come up and look at the screen uh, there and uh, be able to see what's in the screen. And 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 I really want to emphasize this part of it because. To me, it just it's it's great advantage. And yes, if you're in a dark sky, having monitors and stuff is light, you know, can impact people's viewing. But if it's just a general observing area, you, you can people can come up to your table, and it, even if you have two monitors or one monitor, and they can many people can see you, what you're showing at the same time. So you don't have people lined up. Uh, at your telescope, like you can have a lot of people see things at the same time. So what that does is also let you look at more than one object. Uh, so we can look at something for a while, and if there happens to be 25, 50 people there, and everybody's, you know, huddled around and taking turns huddling around the table and, and seeing everything, it's like, okay, let's go to the next thing, versus maybe have to stay on something for, you know, an hour to get through 50, 100 people. Um, you can you you know, you can cycle things. But also, you know, how many times have you all had at an outreach event, you know, a kid come up, grab the eyepiece, put their thumb mm. on the glass mm. or yank on it, right? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we lost the object. Now we've got to go find it again. Um, so those those are huge things, um, you know. And like right now, I've got a solar filter on there. Um, I've done solar outreach before where I've had a mylar filter. Last thing I want is some kid coming along and poking right? Poking at the filter or something or accidentally knocking it off or anything like that. Um, and then to me, one of the most important things is accessibility. So, you know, how many times if you're looking at something that's overhead, not everybody can crouch down and look and, and moms and dads have to lift their kids to be able to see through something that's lower on the horizon. And if someone happens to be in a wheelchair, maybe they can't even look at all, whereas they can roll right up to my desk here, look right into my monitor, and they can see everything. So no, I love that. it's really yeah, a game that's changer. A great point, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just a, such a game changer. So the last thing I want to show you before I show you some of my images is something really cool that we've done a couple times. And so by having an electronic image up here on the left, a live image like this, and, and sometimes you have to tell people, no, it's really live, and you even go over and tap your telescope so the image shakes, you know, to, to prove that you're live. Uh, on the other side of the screen here, I've got Google Earth in moon view. And what we've done before on two different monitors for people is showing the view of the moon live and then finding and, you know, kind of correlating the area here, like this area right here corresponds to right here. And, you know, Google Earth in moon view, view has where different spaceships have landed and such. So we can actually show them on the screen, hey, right in here is where Surveyor 5 landed you know, right in here in this live image. So it, it's it's kind of really a cool thing. That's really cool. It, yeah, and named craters, you know, you, you can show, you know, you can show them what all the names of the craters are as you go through. So it's 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 a super cool. Great idea, Rick. This is yeah. good. Great hey, idea. Rick, Rick, if someone was trying to get into EAA, would you recommend starting off with the longer focal length? 
I, I, I w well, boy, that's a tough call. I mean, you can really do it on any telescope. I mean, one yeah. of the things that we've discussed at, at Explore is, is getting one of the lower end telescopes and sticking a camera in it. Just show people you don't have to have a, even a fancy telescope to do some of this stuff. Right. Um, very true. Yeah. For, so, for D oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to, I'm interested about, uh, are you mainly planetary and solar or i know you do some deep sky also but when it comes to deep sky are you stretching that data in live view or are you just leaving as is or... i'm leaving it as is in okay. fact this is a great uh, let me just show you an example of one the so these are these are still clips right so yeah. so you know what happens is and I'll, I'll show you right now the sun's left my view i'm gonna have to go find it this is my software um that I, for the camera that i have in here the camera that i have in here right now is less than uh 200 dollars. okay not an expensive camera at all and yeah, so yeah i'm pretty sure i have that or i used to have that same camera mm -hmm. it's a great camera i love the imx 184 it's a great mix between planetary it has enough pixels to get you enough detail on planetary but it's sensitive enough that you can really get some great de deep sky it's color um, but doesn't seem to have that much of a loss of sensitivity compared to black and white cameras. I, I love it. Yeah. It's cheap. <laughs> are, I know, I know when it comes to the observatories, but are, don't, I know observatories, they, they take a ton of images also, but don't, don't, aren't the astronomers doing a lot of EAA from observatories? Do you know anything about that? I I don't specifically. Um, I know there are some observatories. E, e, e. Yeah, just like there, um, there are there are observatories that have larger scopes on them that are dedicated to outreach, and that's I think that's really where this this shines. Mm -hmm. However, what I will tell you, well, one of the biggest observatories dedicated to outreach is Mount Wilson's observatories. Yeah, they have a sixty inch and they have a hundred inch. They have done EA, you know, electronically assisted astronomy with them uh, before, and they we've actually broadcast live, um, you know, a night on the sixty inch scope. So wow. um, yeah, that's awesome. uh, yeah, absolutely, you can. Well, yeah, Most hey, of Rick, the EAA hey, applications Rick. I'm aware of are yeah. Hey, th this is focus on astrophotography though, so we got to see your photos, my man. Yep, We're yep, ready to see yep, what yep, you yep. Got. So here's a so here I just want to show you really quick. This is an example. This is just two screen grabs, and I I want to I wanted to bring this up real quick as we jump into that of Orion Nebula at five seconds and then at 15 wow. seconds. And what you see here is Orion blown out like the the triangulum the center areas are completely blown out on the 15 second one, right? But some of the yeah. outer cloud structure here you can't. You can't see with the smaller exposure, but that's kind of what's cool about observing. You can move it around. You can play with your gain a little bit. You can do these different things to bring out different features to see an object um, live as you're doing it. Music to my ears oh, and uh, yeah, beautiful to see with the eyes. Thanks, Rick. Yep, you bet. So let's run through images real quick. I'm not sure where I'm at from a time perspective. So let me let me go through some images. So I've got a few images of the moon including lunar eclipse image and oh, this is an right. example yeah and this is an example again where you've got a very you know uh you have an object that has very different brightness levels so you're gonna blow yeah. stuff out and trying to find that mix is is hard to do in one exposure well that's beautiful um, details yeah wow yeah. now Around here's the sun rig. Now, this is from Excelsior Springs, Missouri, and this is a still from an actual live broadcast I did. So it's on my wow. my Facebook page, even still, um, Astronomy Adventures with Rick, but it's a live view of the eclipse, going into the eclipse, totality, uh, everything. I just, I was so wowed by totality that for f like a few seconds, I forgot to take the solar filter off when it hit totality of <laughs> the telescope. Yes. Yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, mm. yes, it has that effect, as you all know. Um, so here's some different pictures of some planets. Um, so here's Mars, and this is a live shot. And guys, you can kind of see, and gals, you yeah. can kind of see. 
That's you great. know, this was during Mars' closest approach. Some different things of Jupiter. This was a live broadcast I did at the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. And so, as you can see, Jupiter's blown out to be able to get Saturn to kind of yeah. come up. And um, yeah, that's uh, great work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the great conjunction. Nice. Yeah. And I think I had over 60 people on Facebook um, watching it live with me. So, uh, and then we've got different clusters here. Mm -hmm. So this is a mix of different cameras. So uh, the, the camera, some of the cameras here are actually what are called progressive scan cameras. So they actually read the CCD in even numbered rows and come back and fill in with odd number rows. I really don't use that too much anymore because it can give some funky line um, you know, some, some lines in there, but, uh, um, here are, uh, some galaxies. So here's the triangulum galaxy and two of the yeah. Leo triplets here and the sculptor galaxy with quite a bit of detail. This, I'm pretty sure that you this is great. actually, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure this one is a hydrogen alpha image actually. Um, uh, and then here's the scar. Bar, I can really see that middle band too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Bodhi's galaxy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then the horse head, hopefully you can see that there. Oh, mm -hmm. yes, I want to get the horse head. I still I haven't managed to get it, but this is, <laughs> this is great. And this is a single, remember, this is a single shot. I can't remember what the exposure is, maybe 15 seconds or something like that. This is a single exposure, boom. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's good the ring to, nebula. to see what you can get in just a single exposure, yeah. I love Absolutely. That. And then here's the veil with hydrogen alpha narrow band, the Eagle Nebula, hydrogen alpha narrow band, a couple of different wow. cameras here being used. But here you can see the pillars of creation even in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an iconic, the pillars of creation yep. are, is an iconic image. And then the, then the dumbbell here, and we already, I already shared the Orion Nebula here a little bit before. So uh, there's the dumbbell yeah. with some Oops, hydrogen. Uh, Orion Nebula sticking out. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Those big arcs, those big, big tendrils. And then of course that superimposed beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's even some more detail up here, and uh, this is maybe my, even though that center is blown out, this is maybe one of my favorite that I've done. Yeah. And uh, this was done with that less than $200 camera, so, I mean, you can do some great things inexpensively. Oh, yeah. It's, it is shocking. I mean, and one, it doesn't have to be a great photo for it to be your favorite. You know, it's, it's the yep. story behind yep. it, too. Exactly. Well, I think the key part, part uh, Ross, uh, Rick uh, brought up, and Rick, I really want to, that picture of the Orion Nebula, and you made this point several times, is the fact that you you can focus on different details depending on your exposure and your settings. And that's really the, the fun part is the exploration, gleaning out different parts, whether you want to look at the trapezoid, right, and the inner part of the Orion Nebula, for example, or the outer tendrils, uh, the fainter nebulosity. I love to study those. I mean, we went through the pictures pretty quickly, and you know, because of time. But yeah. but but when you can view it, uh, it's, it's it's fantastic. And you may be able to see over here with the dumbbell too. You get the the bulges over here that aren't always obvious. Yes, you can see the ears. You know. Yes. Mm -hmm. you can. Yep. Yes. Yep. But yep. I think uh, Molly Molly was uh, ast astronomer Molly. She was saying um, it looks like a football actually more like a football uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. well hey cameron i was wondering where gillis was going deep today in our in our new segment of gillis goes deep all right taking us awesome hey well first of all you know rick uh, wonderful I, when i saw your uh, nine and a quarter inch uh, you know there i i have a c8 i have the same setup except um except i have the eight inch uh mm -hmm. version of that Mm -hmm. on the evolution mount and you have the heavier mount because it's a nine and a quarter but uh, that's right but yeah I, I i'm on the same boat uh you know we're we haven't met each other but uh i'm working on this uh Camstronomy, uh sky survey which is very much uh, kind of a hybrid approach uh of, of eaa and kind of journey towards astrophotography and kind of to your point about the uh the evolution here i i just want to highlight that the way i see things happening is actually i see them starting to merge as chipsets get more, I, I think we're kind of, it's the golden age of astronomy. I, I was just thinking of an analogy and this reminds me of the PC days when you had, you know, plug in PCI card slots and you'd put in a new graphics card or a new soundboard or a new memory chip. Yep. 
and now we all have phones and, 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 and laptops that are all integrated, smaller, lower power consumption. And they're more powerful than any of those fire breathing, uh, you know, custom rigs of the, of the 90s, right? right. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and what's going to happen here, Rick and everyone is, um, I really see that you're going to have more and more kits available uh, that are going to be, you know, we're, we're playing around. We have to, all the individual parts, but they're just going to start to have kits that are going to become cheaper and cheaper as chipsets get more and more powerful. Right. And you're going to be able to tack on uh, these, these astro imaging EAA, uh, you know, eyepieces, so to speak. And, um, and, and, um, and really start to do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, now, you know. I'm not that far away. If I had if I had an observatory dome or at least a permanent mount, I would not be that far away from being able to automate on a clear night, going to multiple galaxies, taking a very sharp exposure, setting what the gain is based upon the galaxy and brightness, and do supernova hunting, and oh, have yeah. it you save can write those the images. Code in the Go To Stars app. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can write it, the code for that. Exactly, exactly, Great. and you know. Next morning, I'm reviewing to see, hey, did I find any supernovas? Exactly. So that's a good segue, you know, into um, into what I wanted to talk about in this segment. I'll I'll spend about five minutes then to give you an update on how my journey is going uh, uh, in, in in that relation. So what I've discovered uh, on the Tuesday night um, Global Star Party, uh, we had a conversation uh, with Maxi and uh, uh, Maxi uh, Caesar and and Scott. And we were kind of doing a little bit of EAA there. And what I realized is I have an ASIR Pro. And I I was trying to struggle with this. uh, Let me share my screen uh, here. I was struggling with this this, uh, limitation that I was running into. So I'm going to share. Not this one here. Let me stop sharing. Um, You'll remember, um, uh, Cameron, during that conversation, that they brought up this gentleman that uh, became famous for photograph or he was doing i guess video of this galaxy and actually got the supernova as it was happening yes yeah, yes and, and that, uh, i think is, i believe i believe that guy is going to be on the next global star party yeah all right yeah Julio, mm-hmm. that's great <laughs> that's mm-hmm. excellent so uh so yeah, so what I was struggling with, I managed to figure out flats and uh, I still have some issues with some big netting here. I didn't quite, um, and then I got this picture of M51 and you can see these uh, these uh, lines, these bands, which are basically a byproduct of the amplifier noise uh, and, and the line noise. And and the way you get rid of this is with bias frames, okay? So, so um, what was happening is the ASI Pro, uh, Air Pro, uh, has a limitation where yeah i take 100 bias frames that's nice but then uh you choose one of them and uh there was an, the idea was that the reason why i'm still getting these these striations these uh strips here uh even though i was using the bias frame it was only choosing one of the bias frames because you think about the computing power of this little raspberry pi processor and it has to do a live stack it's not going to stack all those 100 bias frames uh, and, and give you a master. So I had some talks with, uh, after that, I, I want to give some, a, a, a shout out to Jeff, Jeff Wise, uh, who has been my buddy, uh, helping me out, uh, really, you know, trying to figure this out and improve my skills. He's, he's much further along the road than I am. He has a very cool setup and he's using, uh, uh Primaluce, uh, Eagles, uh, you know, the, uh, Eagle, uh, processes, which are much more powerful. Uh, but what what we kind of came to the conclusion, we think that, uh, so we started saying, okay, well, what we need to do is create masters. You have to create master flats, master bias, and master uh, darks. That way you can do kind of EAA, uh, uh, you know, uh, live stacking, taking advantage of all the uh, the samples you've taken. And uh, so that's what I did. Uh, I, I, we were trying to figure out how to do that. There's different ways you can do it. You can use deep size sca- stacker. Um, you know, you can use uh, another one called uh, sec- Sequator, um, and uh, and then also uh, Pixin in- Pixinsight, of course. Um, and so Jeff and I were kind of going back and forth in the last couple of days on uh, how do we, you know, 
optimally combine these and make some good quality masters. So what I've discovered, and, and this is still work in progress, I just wanted, you know, this is, I'm showing the, the dirty laundry as we go, right? Uh, we're building the ship as we go. So uh, I just, this is part of the fun and part of the journey. And so yes. Yes, um, when, when this is all said and done, when, when, we, when we do get this figured out, I'm gonna have, we're gonna have a nice little mini session where I'm gonna talk everything for calibration frames, everything, and how we got to this cool uh, repeatable process that's reliable minimum time mm -hmm. and uh, everyone can come on board. But in the meantime, uh, let me show you what I got. So uh, if I go, uh, what I found out is uh, ASI Studio, and I, uh, well, well, let me go back. I'm gonna just uh, go here. Okay, so I have my darks. And I have uh, 30 second darks, uh, 20 of them. I have 20 10 second darks. Because I can only go, because I have an alpha azimuth go to, I can only pretty much go to 30 second exposures before it starts to do the uh, error correction mm -hmm. on, on, on alpha to azimuth uh, for, for the uh, following. Great for visual, but not good for uh, long long term exposures. <laughs> so, um, so, with that in mind, I, I'm limited to 30 seconds. And then I started creating some masters, and Jeff made some. Uh, and I made some with Deep Sky Stacker. And the key thing I want to highlight here is uh, we we were well, I was running into some issues, some limitations. So if I double click on this, uh, this this master that I created in Deep Sky Stacker or even Jeff's, it comes up with an error message. You'll see. See, it says ah the wrong format. Oh darn, you know. So it's like there's probably some header that I have to play with. You know, it's like okay, I have I don't have the time for this. So I kept them playing around and uh, I found out that ASI Air, sorry, is kind of a semi-closed system. So what happens is they they put a little bit of different format on their TIFF files or their FITS files, I should say, uh, their image files. So they have their own stacker. They called ASI Deep Stack. And this is beautiful. This is exactly, because what happens is in Deep Sky Stacker and Pixinsight and all those, you always need to put in a, a light frame and you have to do some funky stuff and it will complain if you don't do certain things. This one allows you to build the stacks uh, independently. So for example, here's my bias frames. I got all 100 bias frames. So if I click through them, you can see the uh, the pixels move around because of the noise. So the line noise moves around just like a, a television set or whenever you're taking a live image. So these if you'll see these lines move around. And then what I do, is you can just only select those, and I'm gonna do it right in front of you. I click on stack, here it goes, and super fast, right? Here it's, it's, it's stacking all those 100 flats, or 100 biases, I should say. And when it's finished here, bang, I go, I can view the folder, and then it creates this, uh, this, uh, this uh, master. So now, Within less than a minute, I have all my 100, and here's my master, uh, see? And you can see how the noise is kind of distributed across, and you can see some vertical lines and some patterns. And then here's the result. I, I did it last night, and it's not perfect yet, but let me show you the result. So here's what it was before with all these lines. And then last night, see, no more lines. But I have other issues. I, ha uh, I have to redo my flats and darks <laughs> because you can see that it's, it's a bit bright on this side. So there's amp glow. So I need to redo the darks. Because I, what happened is I was playing with my imaging train. And every time you touch your imaging train, you're going to have to get new darks, yep. flats, yep. And, and, and everything. That is so, very so basically, uh, yeah. So, so what you need to do, so you, you know, you, you're going to have to do this. And I, you have to make it so that it's a nice, clean, repeatable, simple process so that basically when you get out under the stars, your imaging system, you got all your masters, you can get reliable results, and then you can do EAA, and then eventually, of course, you can do uh, uh, also astrophotography and make them really cool. So I just wanted to show you. So if you look at, uh, oops, sorry, uh, this, is, um, this is a more blown out version. Uh, and I took, this was uh, live stacking, and now I was using the master. So you can see pretty good results. And then and the um, lines are gone. <clears throat> and the lines are gone. And so now, and here's here's M13. Uh, I just wanted to quickly show, and and I, I did some uh, some stretching, yeah. and uh, and then of course I can't help 
but uh, oh, show was 6207. Yeah. The galaxy, you know, I can't help but take a well, shot at that. there's another teeny one like, you uh, probably got in there too, just um, like at 11 o'clock, but a lot closer to M M13. There's, there is a small one somewhere right around above your mouth. Um, yeah, if I, if I, if I, if I, uh, if you stretch let me, it a uh, lot, you'll see it. Hey, Cameron, quick question. Me, uh, are are you matching? Yeah. Real quick, quick question: Are you yeah, matching your gain too when you when you're taking your darks? Are you setting the gain of the camera yes. of what it's going to be too? Okay, good. Yeah, it, I I I've been actually Rick. I've been using 120 the whole time, the the uh, which is mid mid level. Um, that's that's the gain I've been using. So uh, so to your point, uh, I I can probably play with it some more if I want to do like uh, double stars and stuff. Um, but uh, but but for now, I've just set everything to 120. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. So here's the uh, here's the frame. Let's okay. see here. Yeah, we love your. So if I go hours. here, yeah, you can you can see that. You... So here's here's a sky safari, and here see this galaxy here, mm -hmm. PC P uh, yeah, PC zero eight five zero seven seven. It's a magnitude. Uh, let's see here. This guy's, sorry, it's this a little bit lag. So bear oh, with me. Uh, Sixty two oh seven. Come on. Yeah, there we go. 6207 is magnitude 11.3, mm -hmm. uh, but this PCG is a magnitude 16 galaxy, and it's uh, and crazy. We can pick that up quickly. Yeah. And it's it's uh, look at that half a billion light years away, 540 million light years away. So now yeah, if you go to the image, telescope picks it up all day long. You know, on on when you stack, but, and, uh, and there it is. You can see it. You can see it. You can see it right there. Or yeah, just barely. Cool. It's right there. Yeah. So uh, well, some more I, to come. Cameron, so that's that's my update. Yep. Thank you. Thank you again, man. We really love the before and after. So I think that's one of my favorite uh, parts of it because it get, it lets the uh, audience really see um, what the editing does. You know how we get the noise out because that that's what we're really trying to do um, is get the noise out because we want to see what's there. And so Chuck, in everyone's what, favorite what subject thing? or segment, what, Chuck's what? Constellation Crunch, he's going to tell what? us what's in. I, I, we going? We're going on. I think he still has something else to say. <laughs> Hold on for a second. What, 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 one, quick, one quick last thing. I can't help but point out, here's the propeller, everyone, on M13. So you can see it nice, nice. and clearly, clearly. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, yeah no, there's a propeller. So. No, I've never noticed yeah, that. Anyhow, so, yeah, that's the propeller. Just in case you're wondering, it's it's a little bit offset from the center. It's a dark uh, three, three uh, blade propeller. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks, Cameron. Yeah. So I'm going to talk bet. about the Scorpius constellation for my constellation crunch today. Um, it's actually one of the constellations of the zodiac. It's located in the southern celestial hemisphere, near the center of the Milky Way, and actually, um, this is probably my favorite constellation when it comes to visual just because it has that you know iconic hook in the sky and it's very easy to find because of the hook um and then also because uh it's brightest star in terry's um it's actually the 15th brightest star in the sky it's a magnitude of 1.09 um it's a red super giant and also a cool fact is if you were actually to put this star in our constellation i mean not our constellation in our uh, solar system, its surface uh, is so massive, it's huge. it would engulf uh, Mercury and all the planets between Mercury and Mars, and its atmosphere would reach Saturn, which is, uh, you know, something that we just simply can't wrap our no. you know, minds I, I, around. I can't fathom that at all. But I'm a, some of my, uh, I, well, I really like the Catpaw uh, Nebula, and that's actually one of my favorite nebulas, and that's in the Scorpius uh, constellation. Um, if our uh, SAR was some other uh, nebulas, we're actually are we going to show it in? Uh, I've got a Catpaw. We're gonna we're gonna screen share real fast so we can show some of these images. Okay. Let's screen share. Oh no, this is the War and Peace. It's it's, it's okay. okay. This is the War and Peace Nebula. This is actually in uh, the constellation of Scorpius also. Um, Ross, who, you know who did this? Um, this was a guy from Palo Alto, California. So just taking it from light pollution. Um, but he's got those three nanometer Astrodon filters, which everyone needs. 
Um, and I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, but he's on Astro Ben. And I'll zoom in so you guys can see it so we can give him credit. Um, but it's just a great work. It was photo of the day on an Astro Ben a couple months ago. And it's with a Tech 160. And it's about 38 hours of footage. So nice. it is yeah, super. It's, it's a wonderful shot. Go to that. Um, go to that other A pod. I'm not I don't a, have the other. I don't have your. You didn't. I don't have your photos. Okay. Yeah, I think. I think uh, Paul did. Okay. Well, it's okay. Or maybe uh, uh, some of the. Um. So the bug nebula. The bug nebula is in Scorpius. That's an easy target to go after. Of course, the cat's paw. We just went over. Um. M eighty is a famous uh, global cluster in Scorpius. Um, the War and Peace we just saw, and then also probably the coolest one is the Butterfly cl uh, Cluster is also in Scorpius, yeah, yeah. and a little bit of uh, you know mythology on it. In Greek mythology, there's several myths associated with uh, Scorpio. Uh, it's actually um, the myths are uh, associated with Scorpio attributed to Orion. According to one version, Orion boosted to the goddess uh, Artemis and her mother leto that he would kill every animal on earth artemis and leto sent a scorpion to kill orion their battle caught the attention of zeus who raised both combatants to the sky to serve as a remainder for mortals to curb their excessive pride In another version of this myth artemis twin brother apollo was the one who sent the scorpion to kill orion after the hunter earned the goddess favor by admitting she was better than him after Zeus raised Orion and the scorpion to the sky, the former hunts every winter by the fleas every summer when the Scorpio comes in. Mm -hmm. In both versions, Artemis and Zeus is, uh, to raise Orion, basically. But uh, the mythology on this constellation is very interesting. And also, uh, just different parts of the world, uh, they call this constellation different things. Even in America and Hawaii, um, it's known as the Maui fish hook. Oh, um, that's the one from the movie. Yeah. That's the one from the, the kids movie. I know the movie because my I've got a five-year-old. So. Yeah. And then in um, Japan, they refer to it as the broided swan. And then the last one, I think, in um, – that is not on my page. But, oh, the Babylonians uh, considered it – let's see, what does it say? The scorpion they, – they refer to it as the scorpion claw. Okay. So, a little background Very cool. on it. I'm going to pass, pass it back over to Ross, though. All right. Well, um, so Chuck and I, Kent put us to work again this week and gave us an opportunity for a new story. Um, it's quite fun. I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys, if you've got a manual polar scope, you know, just, just go ahead and take it out now. Because um, chances are you probably put it in wrong. Um, I know I put it in wrong. Um, and... I didn't even think about collimating the polar scope. Uh, I just figured, hey, you stick it in there and you're ready to go. Um, that's not the case. So we're learning, um, you know, as we're all boarding this mothership and flying together. So we made a little funny video. We're going to share for you real quick um, about how to, let's see, how to collimate your polar scope. And let's so let's watch a little video here. This is from the Explore Scientific Global Headquarters. You'll want to print out a target. You're going to need a target. We've got one here too. And that's with the trusty manual polar scope. And you just stick that in like so. But you want to go smooth. You want to go slow because there's an O-ring inside that you want it to grab onto, but you don't want that O-ring to move around. And then you got to get the right hex wrench, okay? And you're going to look and you're going to put that target right there in your polar scope, okay? So you might have to adjust the altitude. You might have to adjust the azimuth a little bit, but you want it right there in the middle. And then you're going to move it up and down like so. Basically, you, you don't want it. You don't want the polar scope like if you're turning turning the uh, RA. You don't want that polar scope to move. You want it to to stay on the same uh, on the same spot when you're turning it. Yeah. So, you know, right when you start, you're going to turn it, and the object you're looking at is going to go like this. Okay, that's what it's doing there. And so you adjust those little hex screws. You collimate it, 
you adjust, move it just a little bit, and then you got your thumbs up when you mm -hmm. finish. So you put it to where when you move that RA axis, the spot you're looking at in doesn't move. It stays right there in the center. And then you're collimated and you're ready to go. And I think that's probably good enough instruction since, you know, Wilhelm Struve, as we remember, did not even get any instructions for the great door pad refractor. So there, you all yeah. can figure it out. There is more specific if you go. Nice to, free strain, there Ross. There is. If you go, if you go to our website uh, down at the bottom, uh, help and support, you can find instructions on how how to collimate uh, that polar scope. Yes, yeah, you know, you can definitely find better instructions than what we just gave you, but it's fun, and I didn't even know that you needed to do it. I I never thought about um, it not being in there exactly correct either, and so I guess that explains why I've never really gotten a good polar alignment except when I was first starting and didn't know what I was doing. And that's when I was just, I guess, getting lucky. But we've been doing a lot of work here at Explore Scientific. We've been taking pictures of the sun. Uh, you can see one here. Uh, Kent, after he was showing us how to align with the shadows, um, taking us back uh, to Stonehenge, we were able to get a pretty good shot. This is stacked image with just a regular, regular solar filter here. You can almost see, you know, the lake, the ocean of fire. You got a sunspot there. There's a sunspot up there at the top. It's quite a bit smaller, but uh, you know the sun is very dynamic and it's very great. Uh, you know it's always changing, and that's why it's so great. We got Rick on today. Um, eclipses are awesome. I know two really big ones are coming up. Uh, Texas is going to be a great spot for that. And um, this is so I'm going to show you a week kind of from from photographs that I've taken. This is the heart. In the Soul Nebula, this was imaged, it's about an hour and a half from one night. Um, this was from last night. It's the uh, Elephant Trunk Nebula, also in Cepheus. That's close up. Uh, that's the wide field. You get a little bit of the uh, lobster, I think. Um, but I love the dark, the black clouds. Um, but it's just <clears throat> a fantastic wide field. Uh, great shot with a, with a full frame camera. And there's a little bit of stretch. I'll probably never get my spacing spacing perfect. But then uh, the third image of the night uh, was the Cygnus Loop. And it's all in there with the, even the Pickerines deal. And, um, you know, depending on how dark you want your background, you can always, you can always bring some more detail out, just kind of depending on what you want your final project or final picture to look like. Um, but now we're going to go to story time. Story time with Ross. I'll turn off the screen sharing, and um, we can all sit around the campfire, because I guess what we're all really looking at, whether it's looking at our sun like Rick, uh, or the sun's, the star's way off there, we're really just looking at uh, big, big balls of fire, and so we're going to talk about the North Star, because that's what we polar line, and now you've just collimated your polar scope, so now maybe for the first time you're actually able to point your polar scope and look at Polaris correctly. Um, but, you know, we're aboard the mothership and, you know, time is not really an issue for us. And, you know, Shakespeare, Shakespeare wrote in Julius Caesar that, you know, I am as constant as the North Star. And maybe he knew and maybe Shake or Julius Caesar knew at the time as well, but the North Star is not constant. Um, the Earth is rotating on, um, on another axis. And it takes about 26,000 years to go all the way around that loop. So um, thankfully, the mothership's going to take us, take us along for a little 26,000-year trip. And if we go back a few thousand years real quick here, we're going to go to the time of the pyramids and to the time when Thuban was the North Star. And I thought this one was really interesting to me. Um, it's in Dr uh, Dr Draco, and the Chinese name for it and I will try to pronounce this one just so everyone can laugh, but Zi Wei Yu Yuan Yi. And that means the first star of the right wall of purple forbidden enclosure. And I think the translation is awesome, uh, purple forbidden enclosure. <clears throat> and so that was, you know, four or 5,000 years ago, that was the North Star. And we can keep going back in time. That polar axis keeps shifting around. And if you look at a picture of the, the shift that the Earth does, it, it doesn't look very big. But last night, I was out there looking, and I was just imagining, like, the, the North Star 
our North Star moving around that much, and it is it is quite a big circle that it's going to go on. And so we keep moving back, and then it's we uh, we travel along the snake. So we travel along Draco for a little while, for a few more thousand years. We're going along the snake, and then we get to Hercules. North Star is going to be up in Hercules about twelve thousand years ago. And if we go even further back, the North Star is Vega, and oh, nice. yeah, That's yeah. Crazy. And Vega was the first star I ever was able to to pick out and name. I got Most started serious. years of serious. Serious. Well, it was um, you know, it was about this time three years ago I got started in astronomy, and Vega was the one right up, right up above uh, when when it got dark outside. And you know, we're gonna go back twenty thousand years on the mothership, and we are flying through the wing of the goose. The North Star is flying through the wing of Cygnus. And we're almost back all the way, almost back the farthest of all, so far back that we've come upon what is next. And what is next, the next North Star, is Gamma Cepheus, all ray, and sometimes known as the shepherd's dog. But we're back now, and we have returned. Um, it was a long journey, you know, and what, what we do remember about the North Star, um, no matter where you are, whether you are lost in the woods, trying to make it back, whether you are trying to escape from the South and get to freedom, and you are reading Frederick Doug Douglass's newspaper, the North Star has always represented freedom. So thank you, Mothership, for taking us home. And in one week, hopefully, we'll be back to board again, take another yeah. ride. So um, Captain Roberts, <laughs> can you beam <laughs> us off this ship? Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. Right. Like, That's like, right. Crazy. Okay. Well, great. Um, I think there's a few comments here we should probably bring up. But Beatrice Hines um, w wanted to ask if uh, doing doing um, uh, using the ZWO with the ASI Air also counts electronically assisted astronomy. I think you guys kind of answered that question uh, that it is or can be used that way and. Um, so um, I think that the, the basic concept of EAA is that you're doing, you're showing images uh, relatively unprocessed, okay, um, or lightly processed maybe, uh, if you can keep it going. But the, the actual activity is to kind of show a near real live example of what, what's being presented through the telescope. And so yeah, I, I right. think for a lot of people, that's very exciting. And, um, and the main point about a lot of this, too, is uh, that it is an incredible education experience. And you can share that with people hanging around you, you know, like Rick often does. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it is possible, of course, to, I mean, just as easily share that, that view um, on Zoom and then share it with the whole world. Like, um, you know, we, we often have uh, on the Global Star Party, you know, we have that experience that goes on. So um, let's see. Um, Ernie Jacobs had a question. Uh, is the image scale as important in electronically assisted astronomy as it is with astrophotography? Yeah, absolutely it is. It's really similar. Um, there's really no difference, um, you know, other than you might be able to zoom in a little bit more because with limited exposures for a really extended object that has faint outside edges, you might not be able to see that anyway. So you, mm -hmm. it, you know, but that would be the only case where you wouldn't be worried about, uh, you know, in the, in the same fashion astrophotography is. Great. Okay. Um, Beatrice uh, commented um, that she uses ASI cap or fire capture also for the moon and the sun. So that seems to be, it's probably great software for EAA work. Um, let's see. Um, Martin Eastburn, let's see. Uh, it would be really cool if the real time photo glinted, glinted with the sun. It should, it should be, it should with the foil, with the foil left. I'm not sure what maybe that means, glistened, Martin. Glistened maybe. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you want to uh, ask that question again. Um, but yeah, it would be it would be cool. I think that you were uh, 
perhaps showing an eclipse image or something like that. So, um, you know, and I have seen video of a total eclipse as it was happening. So that's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, people are really I, loving I, this show, guys. So I just you know. had a mylar filter on on an eighty, you know, on a little eighty inch, you know, refractor and eighty millimeter, uh, eighty right? millimeter. Sorry, yeah, not eighty inch. Sorry, <laughs> a little eighty inch would be. Um, a I just nice that, yeah, yeah, I would love to have one of those. Sorry, me but, too. <laughs> yeah, the guys yeah. at uh, at Lowell, uh, at um, Yerkes Observatory would be really jealous of that. So. But even with just a sliver of the sun showing, you know, it's it's yeah. too much, right? And so you you yeah. have to wait till full totality to take the solar filter that's true. off. And I was just too stunned for a second. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. I've seen all those mistakes happen. It's it's really it's really tough when you go to a total eclipse because you either need to be completely focused on your camera gear, and I mean completely focused on your camera gear, or forget about photographing it and just watch the beauty of it you know so well, when is um, the next eclipse scott when it, and i know it's is it in well the, there's going to be an annular eclipse uh in october of okay. uh, 2023 so we're working on an event where you can go see both eclipses from the same place uh and the second eclipse will happen i think it is um april 8th if i'm not mistaken 2024 uh so that's that is uh, i may have that date wrong but uh it is going to be in april and um so uh if we get this uh, this uh, stargazing event uh, put together it's going to be in really dark skies in texas you would fly down or drive down towards san antonio and then you would head uh west from there about an hour and 45 minutes and uh uh, you get down to what I think is about somewhere between Bortle 1 and Bortle 2 sky, so it's really dark. And um, uh, you will be at the, where, you know, where Kent calls the crossroads of uh, the eclipses. And uh, um, it'll be a very unusual experience, I think, to, to go to the same place and see two eclipses like that. And just to be able to say you've done that. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Mike Wiesner says he's waiting for a CMOS imager with Wi-Fi that uses an iPhone or iPad app for imaging and stacking of video or individual images. Yeah, it will get there. Get there. Yeah, yeah, it's probably not too far away, Mike. Probably, As probably Bluetooth. Astro Instruments has the 183 yeah. sensor, and yeah. it will do the, that. They probably yeah. have Bluetooth before Wi-Fi, though, just from a yeah. power perspective. From There's going to be uh, new stuff coming down the pike in the 60, uh, the, the wide gig, uh, 60 gigahertz mm. range, short range, but it's going to give you super wide bandwidth, and that's yeah. going to be the, the, the real cool stuff. Somebody's recommending to Mike uh, to look at astral instruments, so maybe they got something. Uh, Book Davy says there's so many options out there, it's overwhelming. Uh, you know, you got EAA, AP, spectroscopy, photometry, planetary, etc. Or, and, and deep sky. So, uh, Buck, you just got to kind of pick one thing that you're going to go after, stick with it for a while. And and once you reap what you feel are the rewards of that, then move on, you know, if you want to try other things. Uh, you really can spend your whole amateur astronomy lifetime on in one area, one niche. And indeed, you could do it just on one object, you know, so uh it's it's whatever the lens that you want to pick to to you know see the vastness of the universe so um but yeah lots beautiful, of choices beautiful um let's see and uh beatrice Hines says that uh she could see the propeller clearly in m13 uh she said i couldn't see it in my version of m13 I didn't even know about the propeller, Cameron. So again, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's all part of it. This is cool. New. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fun. Uh, let's see. Lots of nice comments here. Do you know a lot of the people here are now friends? Um, you know, and they're they're on the programs almost every day, and. Uh, you know, so it's nice. It's nice to have them on. Um, 
you know, and to see the chatter between them. Um, let's see. Beatrice Hines, Al, Solomon's STEM Adventures is, is that you, Ross? I didn't know that. Carol Locke says, thanks for an inform informative show. Y'all have been great educators. That's very nice. Yep. Well, you got their gears going, you know, and uh, so that means you were all very inspiring. And uh, that's what we're here for, you know, to try to share some of that. And uh, for any of you watching in the audience, you know, if you want to participate on our programs, uh, it's it's not hard to get in, okay? You just need to put together a presentation and uh, contact us in customer service, or you can do send an email to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com, uh, you know, or reach out to anybody in customer service, and we'll be happy to uh, work with you and have you on any of the programs that we do. Uh, so um, we love to have uh, audience participation in our programs. And I guess with that, do you guys have anything else you want to add before we wrap up? One, one quick thing. Okay. I'll share my uh, screen. Just, they were talking, you were talking about the, uh, the bug nebula, or sorry, the, the, the cat's paw nebula, right, Ross? Yes. So this is, this is the unfortunate state. I'm too far north. It's, uh, it's right here. Oh, it's way it's, down it's, there. It's yeah. way down there. So this is the maximum it gets. It's only like seven, eight degrees above the horizon for me, and it's I, I can't see it. So, uh, but but you guys down south, go for it. There's so many juicy things down here in southern. Uh, like, you got southern the cat scorpion. scratch fever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm jealous of that. But hey, then there's the southern hemisphere. I think Maxie's online, but uh, they have a whole bunch of good juicy stuff as well. So it's really nice to be able to share that, you know, across the uh, across the world. We got a hold of you. Yeah. Anyhow, I'll stop. <laughs> yep. Hey, hey, thank Bye. you, Rick. Thanks so much for coming on. You're, it was great. It yeah, really yeah. was. Thank thanks, you, guys. Everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you to the yeah, audience. Thanks, Rick. And, Good stuff. and you guys have a yeah. great weekend. And as my friend Jack Horkheimer always used to say, keep looking up. All right. Take care.